Hi, Glenn. How you doing? Uh, by the way, this is the first time I've ever done this, so. Oh, cool. All right. All right. Um, we'll find out together. <laughs> uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up, for the most part, in Madison, Wisconsin. That's what I think of as home. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us when you were born? Uh, I was born in 1954 and lived the early part of my life out in southwest Kansas for a few years. And, and then uh, my dad eventually caught on with the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So we moved there in 1962. What did, what did your father do? Was your father He's, uh, he was a professor. He, he, he's retired now. But he, uh, yeah, he was, a, he was essentially a plant doctor, if you will, a plant pathologist. He researched plant diseases. Oh, okay. And, Not, nothing uh, to do with music. Had nothing to do with music. Played played a bit of flute and a bit of piano. Okay. And uh, and the radio, as he used to like to say. Uh huh. So you uh, um, so how how old were you when you picked up bass or? I was I believe I, I was fourteen. And I oh I know I was fourteen because uh, late sixties. I had I had I had a very yeah it was nineteen sixty eight and I, and the reason I remember this so clearly is I had a real epiphany. Okay. And my parents carried my brother and I down to San Antonio, Texas for the, uh, I think they call it the Hemisphere, Hemisphere, Hemisphere show, something like that. Okay. Anyway. A music uh, show of some sort? No, it was just like a, like a, like a fair, a okay. big fair. And, uh, but I mean, I was into music at that point. I'd been playing guitar, you know, for a couple of years and, and had my hand in a couple of little, little teeny bobber bands of that era. Uh -huh. We didn't have a bass player. Just seemed like everybody in my neighborhood played guitar or drums, yeah. and that was it, you know. But anyway, long story short, we went on this family vacation down to San Antonio, and and went to this day-long fair, and I saw an ad for a, a live show that was going to be done that afternoon. I thought, well, I want to I want to hear this. It was it looked like kind of a poor man's Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, okay. if you will. And uh, so my brother and I went to the show and, and uh, sat right down front, a little outdoor amphitheater. And as fate would have it, I sat right in front of what turned out to be the bass amp, okay. although I didn't know it at the time. I just thought it was the biggest amp on stage. I sure. thought I want to be in front of that. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and the, the band came out and the bass player played. And, and I remember that, again, my epiphany was that every time he hit a note, my felt rib it. cage resonated, just felt it. And I thought, that is for me. That's, wow, wow. So that's you're one of the few people wanted. that the Beatles and Ed Sullivan wasn't the cue. Well, I mean, I, I believe me, I was in on that. I love that <laughs> stuff, but like I say, I still wanted to be a guitar player at that point. But well, I'm not kidding. When I heard, when felt, I felt, felt that bass, I thought, that's what I got to do. I got to oh, cool. you know. And here's the funny thing about that story. I told that story years ago in Nashville to a group of players I was doing a session with. And the drummer at the time was a, a, a buddy of mine named Tommy Wells. We did hundreds of dates together back in that era. And I had known him for quite some time by then. Anyway, so I'm telling this story to the guys, and Tommy's jaw dropped open. He was the bass player. He was the drummer oh, okay. <laughs> in that band. So, yeah, so it was partly his fault. Yeah. I'm sure I was getting some concussion from the kick drum, too. You know. <laughs> now, did, did you play... Uh, in, in high school, did you? Yeah, yeah. You were a product of the music program. Did your well, school have a jazz band? Or they did have a jazz band that did, I okay. that I did play in. Um, kind of missed the boat in that they had a, a great orchestra program there, but I wasn't into you orchestral into music. Yet. I was not into so it yeah, at all. I wish I had, but my school had a very strong music program in Chicago. Here it was called Nutria, and uh, in order to be in the jazz band, you ha you had to be in the orchestra. It was, it was oh, cool. cool. My, my senior year of high school, I had three periods of the day were music, chamber orchestra, wow. orchestra, and jazz. Oh, fabulous. Some days I'd have a bass lesson. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, I mean, that I, would be. I don't think I play a whole lot better than I do after I <laughs> came out of there, but it, it, was, it was great. So, oh, that's cool. so your school had a program and you were... Uh, well, like I said, I mean, I mean, every public school in those days obviously had music. In those whether days, it be band or choir right. or orchestra, and then there were the extra credit of which, you know, activities of which uh, the jazz band was one. Yeah. So, so uh, what was your first bass? Uh, I had a little uh, Kalamazoo. Oh, Kalamazoo. Turn little, uh, Is that a white one? That's it. That's it? That's exact, except mine was Candy Apple Red, but that's the that's the. Get first, out of here. That's exactly that's got the most I still have it, actually. It's a real thick, dirty tone. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. Plug it in. I had an old. Uh, uh, I had that bass, and I bought a. Uh, I guess it would have been a '67, probably a '67, basement because I remember it was it was the black face. Okay. The 212 cabinet, but it was the big cabinet. It made it look like it was right. something really big, and they were just. I'd be worried that that base would launch speakers. It it did pretty it? much did, which is what I loved about it. It was <laughs> just a big mud bath, you know. <laughs> but you had you probably had to change a few speakers in the base. Uh, oh, I probably should have. I don't think I ever did. You know. That's great. So the, okay, yeah. now. Did you learn to read music in high school? I did just a little bit because of the jazz band program. Right. When I was, I, 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 in my sophomore year, up to my sophomore year, I had always played drums, like in a junior high band. Never, uh -huh. never kit, but just rudimentary snare drum, all that stuff, you know. And, and, you learned to read and, the rhythm. Well, I learned to read rhythms through that, you know. But uh, then, uh, so I, I stuck with that through my sophomore year. Ironically, I had a little bit of a dispute with my band director, who was also the jazz band director, and, and uh, dispute, and I, and I, I flunked high school wow. band. That's interesting. <laughs> Which I didn't care about at the time. Does, I was happy to walk away. Does this teacher that flunked you know what you've gone? Oh on yeah, yeah, yeah. And I won't name names, but he tried later on to take credit for it. My mom <laughs> was a my mom was a school teacher and, in the same school system, and so they would regularly run into each other. And he would always tell her, you know, I knew Glenn had it, and I really tried to help him, and you know, yeah. and, and he, he liked to t he liked to take credit. But the the bone fact was. I went to him, bef bef really what set up my falling out with him is I went to him in my sophomore year for the career guidance uh, counseling thing that they right. offered. And I told him, I said, I don't know how people do this, but I want to learn how to be a studio musician. I want to be one of these guys that plays on people's Record. records. Right. And he just shot me down. He just said, you can't do that. He Not said, good enough? I have a doctor a doctorate degree in music from Berkeley, and I wasn't able to do it. There's no way you could do that. Sounds like it was a personality thing. It was a personality thing. He had a big ego and, and that doesn't uh, I mean that just you go in into a session of that kind of ego and you'll never be asked. Yeah, that. and well and, and the unfortunate thing in his case, I'm I mean I'm don't mean to make a monster out of him. I'm sure he was not a monster, but uh, he had a huge ego. Mine and he too. wasn't a very good player. What, what all this is, is he, he was a bass player. Really? He was a bass player. Although, okay. But, well, you were on his tour. He was, he was dreadful. I mean, I remember the uh, the uh, the choir director was actually a very good bass player, uh -huh. and he, after my falling out with the other guy, he kind of said, "You forget that guy." He said, "You've got a lot of talent." He said, "You need to work on this. You need to work on this." You right. Know, laid it out for me, gave me little tips, and then he actually started calling me and sending me a, as a sub for him on oh, some good. of his gigs. Like you know, pick little up polka, bands and things? Yeah, pick up bands, society bands, uh, Great. polka bands, whatever, okay. you know. So when did you graduate high school? Uh, in, in 1972. Okay. Yeah. Did you go to college? Uh, not immediately, but I wound up going back to college. I went to uh, 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 the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And the okay. reason I went there... My, I have family that, that really? works there now. Oh, cool. But, but so. They, they had, had a, a great music. music they had a really strong music program at so the time. So, is it? Did you pick up up right there? Yet? Yeah, I, I, it was. That was. That's the back end of that story. Having gotten an F on my high school band, and and then deciding I wanted to get, you know, to get some real education, uh, music education, and uh, and I had never studied with anybody. I never never played upright. Never had any classical training or any training really of any sort, apart from a few guitar lessons. Uh, and of course, when they saw my transcripts, I had to meet with the head of the music department. He looked and down at this that. glaring F on my resume <laughs> and said, "You know, something like, what makes you think you want to do this for a living?' You know." But uh, wow, that's interesting. Thankfully, that he 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 very point blank said, "I'm going to break the rules." And I'm going to let you in here, but Excellent. you're on probation, and you're going to have to pick an instrument, one of the classic instruments, and take lessons as part of the. Did you do program. the Samandel method on up? I did. I did. I got through the first 13 pages in four years, but yeah, uh, yeah. I still work out of the Samandel. No, but I, you yeah. have a you use French or German? German. Yeah. The German. guy that I studied. A, isn't that the other way or no? No, I, I well, I think they they don't either way. They, I think they technically. 
the, uh, the, the books that I worked with were Frederick Zimmerman's okay. version of that, and he played German bow. Did you enjoy so it? I remember they showed that, and my teacher played German bow, so that's what I was taught. But I, it's, it's the Samandel method itself works e with either. With either. Now, did you enjoy orchestra? I, I enjoyed when we were actually doing a concert. I okay. enjoyed some of the rehearsals. But I was such a rank beginner, and, and everybody else, uh, we had a brilliant point, teacher yeah. named, named James Clute, who was the, at the time the principal bassist with the Minnesota Orchestra. Lovely guy, brilliant player, great teacher. I'm sure I was the worst student he ever had because I don't think he ever taught beginners. Everybody else had at this had, point, yeah, they'd they, had they, years of private training. Plus, did you? I mean, did you spend a lot of time? Well, I, I didn't, and I wish I had. It's one of the regrets of my life because I just wasn't, I just wasn't into it at that point. Um, I actually had a little sideline career, part-time career. If you was, I was really into pedal steel guitar at that really? point. Really? Yeah. That's my favorite instrument after the bass. Yeah, well, it was mine as well, you and I was it, deadly serious steel. about that. So that got all my attention Really. apart from my music theory classes and that kind of stuff. And, I, and it was one of my favorite things because I got to play. They, you know, nobody knew what a steel guitar was in that. Not in that area. Not, not in the academic circles anyway. Right. Uh, they knew in all the little redneck bars where I was playing. That was I was right at home there. But but I remember playing in in percussion ensembles, marimba ensembles, uh, even uh, doing the occasional big band gig where I would sit there with my steel and play. You know, grab the alto chart or something and just play along wow. with the uh, So with you the you got to be a good reader, obviously. Decent, not great, okay. but decent, you know. And uh, but anyway, back to the the string bass. It has late in life has become my favorite thing of all. It is. It huh? really speaks to me now. But as a as a kid back then, I remember you know borrowing the the bass that they had assigned me, and I would take it and do like dinner theater gigs and things like that. And, and I actually played in a lot of little jazz quartets and quintets, but, but always played electric and that stuff because I wasn't good enough on, on the, upright. the upright to do it. And when I left school, which I did after about two and a half years of study, uh -huh. um, I kind of always had in mind that I would go back, but I never did. So when did you get back in and really dig into it? Uh, into the upright? Upright, yeah. Um, kind of on a dare, and I guess that would have been, it was literally almost a dare from a buddy of mine. He, he, phoned me up. We had another band we were playing in, and he said, man, I want to start a, like a really traditional blues band, uh -huh. and I would love you to be in it, but I'd love you to play string okay. bass, and I was like, well, so anyway, All right, so I, I accepted the dare, not knowing what I was getting into, and uh, it just kind of launched a real a whole new chapter for me to get well, that's immersed cool. in. I, when I played in orchestra in high school, and that would, you know, you'd rehearse for like three months for the concert. You'd just, yeah. every day, you'd knock yeah. out. But I found I really enjoyed then listening to the, the tracks of, uh, you know, the parts that I played in high school. And I really lo loved that. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I, I, I get the impression, either. at least in, in Nashville where I live, all uh, probably like every other school system in, in America, every other public school system, that, the funding is not there anymore, and Same I think in a lot of those schools they've just completely eliminated Got music. It, yeah. it just doesn't exist in the public schools, or not everywhere, but certainly not like when we were kids, which is criminal. Yeah, it is. It really is. Now, all right, so the Kalamazoo, what was your first real day? Uh, well, well, again, I, not to, to diss the Kalamazoo, but you know. No, 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 no. It, 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 it was great and still is for what it is. Uh -huh. little, little mud bunny, like I say. Mud but, bunny. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, uh, I bought a, a used Fender Jazz, and it was a 63 nice. Candy Apple Red. <gasps> Real? And, original paint? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, but, but you got to remember, too, that was about 19, probably, that was probably about 1969 or 1970 when I bought that, so it, it wasn't a big deal. Right. And I remember... Matching uh, headstock? Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it, mine did not have the matching headstock, but... Um, but I, what I remember about the day that I bought it, I'd saved my money up cutting lawns and shoveling driveways in the winter and all that kind of stuff. And I, my dad took me down to this used music store and I, and I bought the bass for $150. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and I remember going home slightly dejected because they had another Fender Jazz. I don't remember what year it would have been, but I was bummed because I had to take the one that had the old brown case instead of the one that had the black case. Yeah, That's really? how dumb I was. Yeah, yeah. You know. Do you still have that bass? Unfortunately, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I let the that one. go. The, the, the truss rod broke in the neck, and nobody around my hometown at those days knew how that. to fix it. We just kind of deemed it DOA. So what, and, what replaced that? Well, actually, I got uh, uh, that would have been about 72, I think, when the bass, when the neck broke, and the local music store ordered me a replacement. So I got a, probably a 72 jazz neck, probably not unlike you, what, what the lawsuit sports there. Uh -huh. And I never made friends with it. It just didn't Too feel the right. Gloss, the yeah, gloss it was finish. very glossy and yep. yeah. So I parted ways with that. And then uh, about that same time, though, I bought a uh, a stripped 63 Precision. Okay, finished down to the bare wood. Yeah, well. I, Somebody took it to the bare wood and then shot it black, you know, and, okay. and, uh, and, and I still have that bass. And as it turned out, um, I've had it refinished uh -huh. in the years since. It's probably the best sounding P bass I've ever owned. And you want to take that good. out? That's I don't. I did take it out one tour and I thought, you know, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of collector value, obviously. Right. Uh, although it's all original apart from the finish. But I thought, you know, if this one got away, this would be just for sentimental reasons, mm -hmm. would be irreplaceable. So I, I don't travel with that one anymore. Let's talk about what you do travel with. So um, you got that red one? You yeah. Can, you can hold that if you don't mind. Sure. And take a look at it. So that, tell us about that face. Well, there's not, I don't have a lot that I can offer on this thing. It's obviously, it's a 68 Telecaster neck and a refinned 68 P base body. Uh, and I bought the two, I bought two different bases and basically put these together. They just seemed to, the neck seemed to want to talk to and with this body. They resonated good together. Uh -huh. And it is, as we were playing this, you guys were passing around the room and it, it, before we started this interview, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a big old, it's a big old ball bat neck, but, uh, and ordinarily I don't necessarily like that, but this one just got a great feel to it and, uh. And I wanted to, to, usually when I come out and do these tours with, with Knopfler, I usually bring a couple of Fenders uh, and, and a, a Rudy Penza five string. And that's what I, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, what color is it? Blue? It's, that one is, is, uh, is, is just a, a natural stain. That's the gentleman that made guitars for Mark. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. did Mark hook you up with that? Or he or did. He did uh, not that particular bass, but he hooked me up with Rudy okay. uh, in 1996, and Rudy made a, a five-string bass for me then. Well, that's that I, Rudy from Rudy's Music, right? Yeah, yeah, that's him. Rudy's used to yeah. carry Lakeland. So yeah. I know him fairly well. Yeah, but. he's a great guy, great yeah. guy. Very, very passionate about They know guitars. their stuff there. He knows his stuff. stuff. He really knows What type of strings stuff. you have? These, I'm not even sure. I'm guessing these are probably labellas, but I couldn't promise that. But anyway, they're just big flats. Flats. And you uh, like a real stiff flat? Uh, not terribly. I mean, these are probably medium gauge. Uh, I, I, one of the things I find myself doing is, is I often have a, just a bit of a vibrato going when I'm playing. I'm not even conscious of it, but right. I sometimes look down, realize it's not nerves. I'm just, you know. It seems like it kind of helps it sing a little bit, which is not what you would ordinarily pick flat wounds for anyway, for sustain. You know? When we're done, I want I wanted you to check out these Pyramid. I, I'd love to. on that white. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pyramid yeah. Golds are like... Oh, yeah. I've got, uh, I've got an old Hoffner uh, club bass, like a they would have 64 pyramids, that I right? put Pyramids on. It's That's what McCartney is. Fantastic. Them, you know? Yeah, they're he never, fabulous. He never remembered yeah. what they called them. He just said they were the shiny ones. Yeah. So, but uh, <laughs> well, he didn't have to worry about that very much, you know. But uh, so what? So um, what else? Do you, so you, do you use the five string? I do. I don't use it that much. Do you um, enjoy playing five, or do you play because you have to? I, you know, I, I enjoy it. Um, I remember talking to Lee Sklar years ago, and we were both having a little laugh at ourselves about the fact that there, there's both. You know, for anybody like ourselves that grew up playing a four string, there's inevitably that moment somewhere 
along the way where you're up the neck and you're doing a nice, what you, what you hope is a nice fill, and you come down and hit the big downbeat and you're on the wrong string. Wrong string. <laughs> <laughs> There's no feeling quite like that in the world. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but anyway, yeah, I did. I, I I resisted five strings for a long time when they first started coming out. I used to. I had another Fender bass that I kept strung with heavy gauge strings, starting usually with like a low C, you know. And uh, and I and years and years ago. Uh, do you have a hip shot on your four string? I thought uh, I, I don't on this one, but I was going to say I, I used to do that, you know, when they came out. I just the early five strings. I I just was not. Convinced. I mean, I heard records that where guys got great sounds out of them, but right. when I would try them out, the the B string just doesn't seem like it's a natural part of the instrument. Well, it just it, it, my my complaint was just it, it seemed like those early issue uh, five did. strings, the, the B string itself didn't seem solid. It a lot have of fundamental that's to a it. lot of that's because thirty four inch scale. Yeah. I think a thirty five inch works better. I think so too. Now the people yeah. that resist it, they don't like that extra. Yeah. Yeah, but if you if you have to play five and you want it to sound good yeah. consistently, I yeah. would recommend a thirty-five inch. I, I I generally do too. The one exception to that uh, are are these couple of bases that I have by Rudy Penza. He hey. still has a I, he may make a thirty-five now. I don't know, but the ones I have are thirty-four. Right. And for whatever reason, they it's a very solid pitch down there. But I remember again the other ones I would try. They, they you, you can make them sound okay in a track, but. When I would solo it, or when I would just be plugged in to headphones, listening to myself, every time I went down, Below. you know, anywhere on the B string, particularly down the low register, it sounded like a different bass. I heard that. I heard it, that. It, the harmonic content was not the same. Long story short, so I, I mean, I resisted, but I eventually, uh, I, I bought a, uh, I guess it would have been an '87. I bought a modulus graphite. I like those five string. I still got it. It's just good stuff. It, it, it it does one. Th it's it's a you know the the bolt on neck before they start going to exotic woods. It just has EMG jazz pickups in it. It does one thing and one thing only. You can't. I mean, you can't use it in a like an acoustic track. It's just way too aggressive sounding. But what? in a rock and roll band or something right. where you need to really carry the bottom. That thing will do that. What bass did you use? Is it Silvertown Blues? Is that what I'm? Thinking? Yeah. What that, would that be? That would have been a. Probably my old 63 P bass. Just tuned guessing. down. Just tuned down. Because that hits a D, I think. Yeah. Right? Or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, that, I did that for many, many years, and and still do it. Uh, to me, there's uh, there's a different sound. Just a Fender bass with a drop D on it is it's a different sounding D than right. on any five string. It's In fact, looser. one of the uh, pardon. I don't know. Is it looser sounding or? I, or I don't know. It just seems more. Def Defined. It's got got a bigger rib cage on it somehow okay. or another. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but one of the bases that I always bring out with Mark, my alternate bass, uh, apart from the pensive five string, is always a Fender with a with a drop D. Did you use that the other night? Did I it used it on white? one song. Or what color is that? Yeah, it's kind of again, it's a refin. It's it's uh, kind of like a blonde slash white finish. What year is it? It's a '64. Okay. And. Uh, Rosewood fingerboard. Yeah, mm -hmm. I used that on uh, um, Hill Farmer Blues. Okay. Um, and 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 sometimes some other songs, although we're not doing them in this particular tour. Very cool. Uh, amplifier. We. What, what what is your stage amp right now? Well, my stage amp. I've got a, a pair of old uh, SVTs. Blue amp phase, egg. black phase. Uh, no, they're the old the, the, the blue, blue line. They're ones a uh, I think ones a. 70 and the other I believe is a 69. And they're both tubed up and working yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They get you don't a little, have to carry a little. Yourself. I don't carry them myself. Yeah, that's the. Now good at home, thing. if you do a gig, Bluebird or, or or do a club, what do you bring? Well, it depends. I mean, if it's an electric gig. Yeah, say. if, I mean, a lot of the gigs. I, I don't do that many live gigs anymore. Unfortunately, I kind of have have, not by intent, have kind of let go of that. I, I hope to. Get a couple live things put together, so I just get out with my pals. Oh, you're again. getting out with Marco. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> takes care home, of a so lot of that. But at home, so uh, what would you use? Well, it depends. I mean, I've I've got a a nest of these old Ampeg B15s that I've gathered up through the years. How many is it? Sometimes, nest? oh, I, I probably have. Uh, I'm sure I've got four of them. Maybe, okay. Maybe a, those. A fifth. I mean, 
I think they're great sounding and they do well in recording, but it, depending on the stage Well, it depends volume, on, uh, on the well. stage five. Sometimes, what I used to do when I was a kid, uh, I had four of them, and I played in a little trio. This was back in Madison before I went to college or any of that. And, uh, and uh, the guitar player in the band had like a pro reverb or something like that, and he had a, a matching extension cabinet. Okay. I had these four B-15s, which was what? 30 watts each, with yeah. a whole lot of wattage. Okay, but, put them together. You, but, you yeah, well, I'd set two B-15s on one side of the stage and two on the other, and, really? well, he, and he had his pro reverb. An army of B-15s. And we weren't the loudest band. We weren't going so much for volume, but, boy, it, it moved a lot of air. Though. Yeah. So all these years later, upon occasion, if, if I know I'm going to be playing like a singer-songwriter gig or something like that where it's not going to be too loud, sometimes I'll take two of those and, okay. you know, uh, but uh, no past that, I've got an old uh, SWR rig I've had. Redhead forever. or what? No, it's, uh, it's one of the, what they call it, SM400s. You know, it's that old, yeah, yeah, one of their yeah. first With the grab, issue. with the parametric yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, I've got that in the 410 cabinet. And, you know, it'll still keep up with oh, sure. most of those things. You know. Sure. But if it's, you know, like uh, most of my live work tends to be more in the way of Maybe the odd TV special or something like that, and then generally they will just supply you with an. They'll SCT. either supply it or they will let us use our cartridge companies, and they'll bring my rig out for that. You cool. Know. Well, when we're done, it, I do want to show you these up front. Absolutely. Really cool. Absolutely. Lightweight. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's the difference too. If I was hauling this stuff around myself, no yeah. way I'd be throwing a hundred-pound SVT head in the car. No, no. Um, so. Uh, you went to school, you said for a couple of years, and mm -hmm. then, um, so what are we at, around 75, 76? Yeah, yeah, up through the, I went through the summer of 75. Okay, and then? And then I decided, uh, I, I realized, apart from like about a six month period after I graduated high school and before I went back to college, uh, to start college, um, I realized I just didn't know very much about music, and, and that's why I went, chose to go to a, a music-oriented college and study. But apart from that little interim period there, there was, had never been another time in my life to that point that I'd been a full-time musician. And I thought, I was kind of running out of money, and I was kind of hitting the, the more academic end of the, of the college yeah. curriculum, i.e., where they would teach you how to be a band director and things like that. And I knew I didn't want that to do it. I just wasn't going to do that. Uh -huh. All those combination of things plus realizing that I'd never been just a full-time musician. You didn't have your cavern club I thought, a couple of years. I thought, oh, guys, it's time to pitch out and, and you know, become a full-time musician. So, so how I, did you do so that? So I quit school and, and got, a, got a road gig with, you know, like a top 40 band. A cover kind of band? Just cover bands, yeah, uh -huh. and did various incarnations of that, different bands. We, uh, living still, home base was still Madison. Well, at that point it was, but uh, uh, but I was never home. Uh, maybe the holidays, you know, because they were full time traveling bands. I mean, I don't know if that even exists anymore in the sense of cover bands doing yeah. that. But that's that's what I was doing at the time, and I can't say I enjoyed it. Terribly. I mean, I enjoyed some of the musicians I got to work with. I certainly enjoyed seeing the country, you know, but sure. a lot of the bands I was with, quite frankly, were pretty meager. Meager, you know? I got you. So, and how did, so take us, when did you get to Nashville? Or well, I, 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 I uh, after about four years, not, well, I guess, yeah, it would have been close to four years of doing, doing that top 40 slash country band circuit. Uh, I finally decided I've got, I've got to make a stand somewhere. I can't do this the rest of my life. And uh, so I, I took a hard look at several towns, uh, New Orleans and, and uh, Los Angeles, even Minneapolis. Uh -huh. uh, but Nashville seemed to be the one that made the most sense to me, and I wound up committing now to I'm, moving to I'm, Nashville. I'm guessing that country music is probably not your... Was it your favorite type of music? Or? It, it, it actually is among my favorite types of music. I mean, when I was a kid in Madison, probably my favorite was blues, Chicago blues is what okay. I, uh, I played more of that than I played anything else. But 
the little trio that I played with most of my high school years, we, we played a lot of country music. We, you know, we were into Graham Parsons and the Birds and, and uh, all that stuff. We, we thought, well, this is, this is cool. This is, it wasn't, you know, as I always say, it wasn't your daddy's country music. Well, yeah, it's funny, because I asked, Joe Osborne recorded uh, two tracks with Graham Parsons mm. in 67 on the International Submarine, whatever they, they call the record, Home at Last or Safe at Home. Anyways, but I, I asked Joe, I'm like, because Joe did spend a lot of time in Nashville, and I, I said, I want to know the difference between rock and country rock. And he, we, we were listening to the Graham Parsons track that he was on, and he would step up to the fifth or come back down to the fourth, not the formula, mm -hmm. not the Nashville formula. Right. And basically explain to me, country rock gives you more freedom in, yep. in the way you move up to the, to mm -hmm. the note or back down to the yeah. note. It, was, yeah. it made a lot of sense. Yeah, and I remember again with these buddies of mine, we were all into it and, and we basically, uh, I remember going to see Merle Haggard for the first time. Uh, my dad took me um, and I had only read about him. I didn't know anything. I'd never heard any of his music. Right. But I kept hearing all these rave reviews and and I went to this show, and and, uh, and while he was singing, I was, I mean, my jaw was on the floor. And I just remember thinking, this guy's singing the same thing that Muddy Waters is singing about. It's it's, it's life, right? It doesn't sound like it, but it's the same subject matter, you know. And I thought this is this is just another form of the blues. And and in that moment, and I still believe this, but in that moment, I remember thinking, this is every bit as valid as any other form of music in the world, if it's done right, right, if it's done from the heart and done emotionally. I, I, I mean, I, I remember that's one of the things I liked about the Birds and, and Buffalo Springfield. They had those little elements of country music, but they weren't totally respectful of it to the, to the degree of... With the left hand... They would take chances with it, yeah. yeah. They would, you know, the drums were louder. They, you know, the, the bass was all over the place compared to the the more organized, quote unquote, professional Nashville records were, you know, all of which appealed to me as a kid and still does. You know? Right. Well, Joe also, he got frustrated in Nashville because the producers didn't really want you to step out, at least, we're, this would be mid-70s mm -hmm. to, I think he gave up around 1980 because they just, you know, they wanted to hear a certain thing and it yeah. wasn't his thing. Well, there were there were a handful of producers that totally understood what Joe was about and hired him for it, and then there were a lot of guys that didn't probably. They asked him to play with his fingers. About. You yeah. can't do Joe can't play with his fingers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he you know Joe was such an iconic player, such a beautiful player. That I mean, he, you know, he was he was an artist who right. happened to play the bass, in my yeah. view. You know, so asking an artist to do something like constantly, that yeah, yeah. It got to him. Yeah, drinking one didn't help either. No, no, sadly not. <laughs> um, when you when you record, do you normally record direct, mic damp, or combination of the both. My preference is, is generally not always, but my preference is usually to have both. Both. Yeah. And then you get choose between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Rick and Jack. Um, when you record. Do you prefer doing the, the rhythm tracks live or overdub, or is it, again, just depending well, on the, the, deep, the music? I I always, my first preference would be to play live with a live rhythm section in the moment. Yeah. And that's one thing that Nashville has kind of held on to. We've had some waves of experimentation uh, when I first started doing sessions, which would have been in the early 80s. There were a few, particularly some jingle accounts that I got into where, you know, they'd have a guy program the drums and then they'd put me on and, and build the tracks up. And I just remember thinking, man, if this is how we're going to make records, I don't want to be a recording musician. It was right. so boring. I mean, there was a, there was a freedom sometimes, you know, um, because you weren't bound by anything. You could try a lot of different ideas, not so much in jingles, but in record dates. But it just, to me, was not a completely joyless way to go about it, but not as joyful as that thing. Actually of just, making music. Right? Yeah, and, and I've always said half of the, the, the greatest music of all time, or at least in terms of pop music, certainly not symphonic, but in pop music, 
music. You got to believe that uh, I say half, but a big percentage of those those things have got you know the great moments sometimes come about out of a mistake, right? Or somebody hits a bum note, and it's everybody says, "Wait a minute, that's a better note. Let's do let's let's make that the harmony." You know, right? And those kind of happy mistakes, I think, are are often. Well, they make it a little bit interesting versus they do. completely and, and, sterile and, and everything perfect. Yeah, and I will say too that you know one of the things that I I, I mean I've, I've spent you know uh, I guess almost the last thirty years playing to click track because somewhere along the way people decided that was a good thing. Um, I'm not convinced it is you in know, every I, situation. It, the yeah. old timers, again, this is Joe, and I've heard him talk to Dave Ungate. They hate the click. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. they want to choose where where they want to be. And well, that's just exactly it. I've always said, you know, they never use them. I mean, if you're making a dance track, fine. If, if, you know, if you just want absolute brutal consistency, if that's the if that's the desired commodity, then yeah, turn the click on. You know, so, if you've got a dodgy rhythm section, sometimes a click track will help pull it right. together to a certain degree. But but. I always think of rhythm, uh, tempo rather, as being, as m it's one of the most emotional components of making music. You know, Absolutely. you don't ask a singer to sing every note at the exact same intensity. Um, you, you don't, you know, you don't ask a band to play the verse as big as, say, the chorus. You know, so if you take volume out of the equation, dynamics, it, does that not greatly strip down the emotional content? To me, the same thing, you know, there's nothing wrong with there being a little lift going into that chorus. Right. There's nothing wrong with the chorus being a little bit faster or perhaps a little bit slower if it's a ballad. And then come out of the chorus and that. you're back into a verse and that should have it someplace. I'm not, I'm, to be clear though, I am not advocating Poor timekeeping. <laughs> right. You have to be able to play great time to be able to manage those things with some grace. You know, yeah, another, big I difference. Mean, another aspect is, I think, uh, using a bass that might have a little distortion to it, mm -hmm. or might have a little single coil hum, or yeah. or something. A lot oh, of yeah. that people are are too tuned into just they want it perfect, yeah. and I think having distortion or yeah. something like that yeah. adds to the character. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that uh, okay. uh, a couple pals and I, we've started uh, a little production company. We've got a couple country records that we've done. And one of the things, one of the happy accidents we stumbled into, um, we were doing a, a record a couple years ago and I had my B-15 and I had it set where it was pretty clean, you know, just a good solid fundamental sound. I had brought in this little, I don't know even what it is, a little student model bass amp uh -huh. that you can't, I mean, the speaker's probably blown. I mean, it just farts on every note. And I plugged into it at the same time as the B-15, and we decided to mic it up. And I'm telling you, the two of them together, not on every track, but it was amazing how much that little amp contributed to the overall the sound. Time. And you can't necessarily, I mean, there might be a moment or two where you, you would get, catch a sonic glimpse of that and hear it. But for the most part, you never know that it's actually a, a very distorted signal mixed in with, with, the with it. But you take it out, it's a significant difference in the sound. And, and we decided for, for some of these records, it's, it's a good addition. Do you, have some, do you have some producers you work for who are a little more, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, Looking to try to find new sounds and better sounds. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, do they spend? Do they give you some time to try to dial in? Yeah, uh, you know, I think we were talking earlier. You know, because record sales, CD sales, are not what they once were, and the profit margins in general are not what they once were for the labels. Every producer is faced with an ever decreasing budget with which to make his or her record. So. The, the decreasing amount of available time does tend to kind of shut down how much chance you get to explore, look for new sonics and right. new arrangements. But that said, I, my favorite people that I work for, uh, not just in Nashville, anywhere in the globe, are the ones that 
still put a priority on, yeah, let's not just do the obvious. Let's, let's try something different, you know. And I've witnessed a very dramatic sea change in Nashville that way because in my early years as a hired gun bass player there, one of the reasons I caught on was because I was essentially a quick study. I could read it. I could hear it. Um, I get, got my part together very quickly, and, and I got a reputation that I wasn't terribly proud of, but I got a reputation as being a, a solid guy that would, you know, you weren't going to be waiting on me to get a record done. That wasn't really what I wanted a reputation built on, though, you know, and, and I had a, a fretless Steinberger, maybe the guy that works on my bases in Nashville thinks it maybe was the first one that they made. Joe Glazer? Or Joe Glazer. Okay, yeah. cool. Very, very early model. So, so early that they put the, uh, the, the dot markers on the side Rocks in the wrong that. place. <laughs> you, can't, you can't look at those dots and it pull, you'll be way out of tune. But anyway, it was a great sound base. Thankfully, I still have it. And I started using it where I could. And there, you know, some of the young songwriters whose demos I was doing back in that era. They were all for it. They, it was something new to them, and they liked it. Yeah. And little by little, some of those song demos were heard by the guys that were doing the uh, producing the records of that era. I'm talking about mid '80s, early to mid '80s. And uh, uh, I remember getting a call from a guy who was uh, uh, a wonderful guy and a great producer, but very traditional country records, and he had huge records back in the day. Um, and he called me up and said, I, I, I have been told that this is a bass that you're playing, but I, I thought it was a was synthesizer. It, was this before Jocko? Or, or oh, no, this was well after Jocko. Okay. But, but when I, the way I played the bass, uh, the fretless bass, was nothing like Jocko. I mean, I, I, I adored Jocko. I spent a couple of years like everybody else trying to figure out, figure what, out what in the world he was doing. Uh, but but my attitude with, with playing fretless was at, at that point and, and still uh, is I only wanted to occasionally give away the fact that it was a fretless. I, I liked the fatness of the sound. Um, just right. the sound itself was, sure, was, sure. was more the deal than, than, than a lot of glissandos, you know. Right. Anyway, this producer is kind of indicative of what I was going to say. He called me up, and he didn't know what it was. He had right. never seen a fretless bass. He was an old-school country guy, you know. And uh, and like I say, he thought uh, that it that maybe it was a synthesizer. Sure. But when people said, no, that's Glenn Wharf, and that's this fretless bass, well, he he took a chance on me and 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 called me specifically to play that bass on really? several very, very it? traditional country albums of that time. What year? I'm guessing about 85, okay. maybe so did 86. Did you do a lot of fretless work? Then? I did a ton of it. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah, very, I mean, it was it was kind of became one of my, you know, one of my calling cards. Well, but I guess I think of like Pino who made a very oh, bold yeah. statement with Absolutely. the octave and the fretless. Yeah. You were a little more... Yeah, well, this and this was a long time ago too. I mean, and again, I was involved uh, to a large degree in a, in a kind of music, country music of that era was still quite traditional, you know, and 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 therefore quite resistant to a lot of new sounds. But they did like they that. It was a it was a change for them. And then there were other bands, uh, other projects that I did where I greatly exaggerated the fact that it was. Fretless, you know. Yeah. Well, you're, I'm going to get a list from you before I, yeah. before I leave today. So well, I go back and hear some of that. I'd my like my point out of all this, I guess, is that, uh, you know, I, I recognize at some point I wanted to have, I wanted to give people a reason to call me a, apart from the idea that, oh, he's just going to be dependable or he's yeah. fast or he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. I mean, that's all, that's all well and good, but that's not kind of what you want your career to be based right. on. So as I began to explore some of these other things and tuck in some other alternatives. About that time, uh, the, the producers themselves, kind of a younger generation of producers, began to take the wheel. And they were ever so much more receptive to okay. the idea of saying, yeah, let's try this, let's try that, whatever you want, you know, whatever you want to do. And those, thankfully, there's, there's a handful of those guys that I still work for quite a bit. They still have that beautiful curiosity and oh, willingness great. And I think that's why they're still viable producers, actually. 
noticed, you know, seeing you play the other night, you you use your fingers, you use your thumb, mm-hmm. you uh, use a pick. Mm-hmm. Um, you, if, if someone had to ask, are you a fingers or pick player, what do you primarily, or do well, you want to be all of the above? I'm primarily a fingers player. I mean, that's what I, I remember when I was a, Alternating two yeah. fingers? Mm-hmm. Standard. Yeah. And I remember, well, alternating fingers, uh, um, um, Sometimes, if, if in the early parts of a song or soft parts, I'll just kind of brush with the side of my thumb, just okay, try to get that right. meaty sound. Uh, I, I don't play steel guitar anymore; I haven't for many years. But I do have a holdover. Uh, you know, steel guitar you generally play with a thumb pick and right. two or three finger picks. Well, I don't use the picks anymore, but I'll often do some kind of a rolling thing or, cool. okay. you know, sort of a. It, that's a holdover from my steel guitar days, you know. Um, but, I mean, all these things, uh, you know, a pick or a different set of strings or a different instrument, different amp, I tend to think of myself when, I'm, when I am hired on as a bass player. M- what my preference is is that it's going to give me a chance to sort of get into character, if you will, much like a character actor would do. Because okay. I'm not making my record. I'm helping somebody else make theirs, and uh, it, his or her songs are what we're playing. They're not my songs, not my record. So that said, I like to think, if I were in this person's band, what would I play? Right. You know? And sometimes, to the degree, if it's, if it's a young artist and, and Again, I'm thinking about being their band. I might think, well, all right, here's a young artist, and if I'm in the band, I'm probably a young bass player. I probably only own one bass, or maybe two, and I'll try to pick one or two basses for that record. And I know we're we're splitting here, we're splitting hairs here sonically, obviously, but right. I I think those things are important because I think it helps imbue a. a a trademark sound or something, or at least not a trademark sound, but a a bit of an identity. It helps sometimes the artist to have that. At least that's my take on it. Sure, sure. Um, we talk about Mark for a minute. Sure. Okay. Uh, how did you get uh, How did you get hooked up with Mark? Well, it, it's a funny story. Um, in back like the late 80s, certainly well all through the 90s, I was just buried alive in session work, thankfully. Absolutely working as much as I could physically get well, to. You were, doing, you were doing between 30 and 50 <laughs> major oh, it was, label it was, it, was at the abs- it was at the absolute peak of, of the record business, basically, right. in terms of sales. You probably working seven days, oh, seven days a week? Oh, could have easily done it. I mean, I eventually got to where I'd quit working Sundays and then eventually took Saturdays out of the calendar, just trying to have a little bit of time with my family, you know. But anyway, in the face of all that, though, I was also kind of losing my mind because so much of the music I was doing, while it was great paying and, uh, and, and, and very, very steady work, and I was grateful to have all that, it didn't do a lot for my soul. It was I kind of sometimes felt like I was playing the same three songs every day, every day, every day. Different artists, but the same three songs, you know. Uh-huh. And so anyway, uh, I, I had always kept my hand in some of these little part-time local bands, usually with singer-songwriter friends of mine. And, uh, and I, I played several nights a week with, the, with each of these four or five different bands. And one night I was playing at the Bluebird Cafe with a buddy of mine named Kevin Welch. And, uh, and he, he was, was and is a great singer-songwriter. We always had a packed house every time we played with him. And it was very cutting edge for country music of that time. He Would was you call way, country rock or? Yeah, definitely more of a rock and roll sensibility. I was okay. playing the fretless a lot in his band. I mean, uh-huh. we were, and we were, we were not the least bit interested necessarily trying to get on the radio, although we did a couple records with him. Um, but it was much more about just trying to play honest music and going for it. And anyway, long story short, um, one night we were playing down there and, and Mark happened to come Mark out. Knopfler, was, yeah, Mark Knopfler. Mark <laughs> Knopfler. And he was uh, seated up at the bar and we finished the first set and I walked back, 
past the barn, I saw, all of a sudden I saw this big mitt stuck out, and on the other end of it was Mark Knopfler, and he introduced himself. And it was very complimentary, and I was just, I was just well, knocked down, you know. Year, I just, what year was this? This was uh, probably 92. Okay. I think probably late 92, if I remember right. Right. Um, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, we, we exchanged compliments, and, and, and I didn't want to germ him, so I didn't, I didn't speak to him more in a couple minutes. And a few months later, early 93, I suppose it was, um, I got a call from his co-producer asking if I would be interested in playing on a track when he came to Nashville. I said, absolutely, you know. And that was sort of the beginning of it for he and I. I mean, uh, that, that was the beginning stages of his first, solo record and uh, which record was that What's the title? well it, it was uh, called uh, Golden Heart was the name of the album that wasn't the song we cut we actually cut uh, a song called Speedway at Nazareth the, the first time I Is recorded that on that with him. it's not on that record and that <laughs> version never lived to see the light of day we we cut a completely different version of that song um, years later and and uh, it, I think it's one of the coolest songs he ever wrote. And that's available? That's available. I think that's on, uh, I, I'm so bad about remembering right, the title. We'll look it up. Yeah, it's, <laughs> on, it's, it's on one of his earlier uh, solo records, but not, not the first one. Okay. But anyway, that, uh, that led to the beginnings of a friendship, and, and, and uh, a year or two later I got called to play on another round of songs with him. At, at that point, he had he had cut with several different rhythm sections in Nashville and New Orleans and some Irish musicians in Ireland. He was just kind of literally all over the globe, trying to capture what was in his mind as a as a now solo artist, first time ever uh, without his longtime band Dire Straits, and it just worked out very fortunately for me and for several of us. That we connected with him on some level. Who was the drummer? Uh, the drummer in that, the, well, and there were several drummers again that played okay. on that record, but the one that I worked with, the batch of songs that I did, was Chad Cromwell. Oh, Chad. Okay. Yeah. We met Chad. He was here with, with Neil. Yeah. 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 What a sweet guy. <laughs> oh, he's a great guy. He's one of my dearest friends. And, uh, and uh, anyway, that. Uh, that kind of became the core of Mark's new band. After after he had made that record, he kind of went back through and, I guess, made up his mind who he wanted to pull from these various rhythm sections. Right, and, put together a band. And, and put together a touring band for that record, uh, Golden Heart. And so we toured together in 1996. With Chad? With Chad. Uh -huh. Richard Bennett on guitar. Guy Fletcher, his longtime yeah. collaborator in Dire Straits. And... Uh, I don't believe, I, th I think that Mark offered the piano chair to a couple of different guys from Nashville, but neither of whom were able to take the tour on. And uh, several of us recommended a buddy of ours from L.A. that we had worked with, a brilliant session guy out of L.A. named Jim Cox. Uh -huh. He came on that tour and then basically became, that became Mark's band there for quite some time. And we've had a few personnel changes. Uh, Chad's no longer with us. The guy that took his place is no longer with us. Um, Who is on drums now? Uh, now we've got a brilliant drummer named Ian Thomas. He's kind of a... Is it British? No. He's British, yeah. He's a Welshman. And he's he's probably, the my guess would be, he's probably the top call in, in England. England. He's just a monstrous player. And he all, it makes time to go on tour. Oh, you, you well... All, you all seem to... We do. I mean, I don't know how much advance warning he gives you, because I mean... Oh, we, we know well in advance. It's not a, it's never a drop of the hat kind right. of thing. I mean, for instance, we know and have known for some time that we will go out and do a tour of Europe next year, and, and we know what the starting date of rehearsals are. We know right. what, what the last day of the tour will be. We know we, it's already booked. They know exactly where we will be. They probably haven't booked all the hotels yet, but you know, but they, they operate way, way out. And, I mean, to be clear, right, he's your first priority. Absolutely, right yeah. And, and and because of the fact that I, I just 
so adore his his musicianship and his songwriting. I'm a song guy. I, I'm not right. a technical player per se. I don't have music store chops. Uh -huh. Nobody's going to be blown away by anything I do on the instrument. Oh, I don't know. My about thing that. is <laughs> my, my my one and only thing is I, I live for a great song, a great lyric. Right. And if somebody gives me that, man, that that gives me the opportunity to bring. Mark, I think my best game and listening Mark, to Mark is the, like getting a history lesson. You know, I mean, well, it, it is, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, uh, Sailing to Philadelphia is one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, did did James Taylor come in and sing and Van Morrison and those guys? Were you with them? Uh, I was or? there. James came in and sang with us in uh, Nashville. Yeah, in Nashville. Great. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was kind of a. I think a double-edged thing that, that uh, uh, Mark, when he wrote uh, Sailing to Philadelphia, he said he, he very clearly pictured James <laughs> as perfect. being the, the, the high voice, the, there. The, high voice the duet partner on it. So, so when we actually recorded it, James was there. And, and then we wound up in the, the day or two after that, we cut a couple tracks uh, for what was going to become James's record. Oh yeah, and Mark was going to produce that, but uh, sadly, it, it it wound up. We did those couple of tracks, uh, and then Mark just got so busy finishing up his record and getting ready for the tour that he just, between their schedules, they they never got that record finished. Much much to my regret, because I'm a huge huge James Taylor fan. Uh oh, I got the what oh. Um, Does he bring in bass parts? Does he let you step out, or how does that work? Well, it's a it's a blend. Um, he and, and his longtime uh, co-conspirator Guy Fletcher, who's a great musician and a great engineer, um, they lately, the last few records we've done at Mark's studio, the two of them will will sometimes record the, the you know the the guts of the track. I mean, it'll be a a keeper uh, guitar part on Mark's part, sometimes keeper vocals. And then they'll flesh it out with either keyboards or, or other instruments. Sometimes Mark will put other guitars on. Uh, and Guy is a wonderful bass player himself. Mark plays great bass, at least in the, he wouldn't tell you that, but I think he does in the, in the sense of coming right. up with great notes. And Are any of the Dire Straits recordings Mark on bass? I don't think he ever physically okay. played it, but I guarantee you he was involved in the, he was involved in the creation of every one of those bass lines. Yeah. And is that is that how you work with him? Well, to some degree. I mean, um, you know, um, and, and like I say, there's no definite way that we go about things. He always presents, if he's got these songs already fleshed out, he will generally tell us, this is what I want to keep, and it's not yet been the bass part. It's always been like, you know, and some of them have been just great. I mean, I said, man, I, I'm happy to play it again, but what you've got is great. But he always makes me play again, and it always winds up, usually, I guess, anyway, that that uh, that becomes the you know the track. Oh, I did it again. All right, guys. Um, but that's not always the case. I mean, some some songs he brings in in pretty much their raw state. He'll just sit there with his right. acoustic guitar and play them down to us, and then we start from scratch on those. But it's Both of those things I really like doing. Um, again, because he and Guy have such beautiful ideas, um, when, it, when it comes to a bass part, I will often just, just shamelessly steal from them and then just find my own way to kind of turn the corners a here and there a little there. bit different, which they give me so much freedom to do, you know. But you know, you, you'd said something earlier, and this may be a good time to actually, I don't think I ever answered it, this might be a good time to answer it. When you were asking about, do I prefer recording with a live band or overdubs? I do enjoy both those things. The, the advantage of doing it, just uh, doing a session just uh, as an overdub, you, you have time to think, you have time to be very specific about it, you have time to try different things all of which I really enjoy doing. The downside of overdubbing, I always feel, is that it's a bit like trying to take part in a conversation that has already happened. Oh, I see. Because 
one of the things I'm always conscious of, and I swear I hear it on a lot of records, where I'll think, you know, that's a great bass part. If he or she had played that part live, I mean, with the rhythm section, the drummer would have given him something back, or the piano player would have leaned in and voiced a chord to go with it. It would have been that call and response thing. And that you don't get, I mean, you can, you know, if you're very clever about it, you Which can create the illusion. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the difference between it. There's no, no right or wrong, but that's the difference to me. Um, if it's okay, I did, off of the All Music Guide on the internet, mm -hmm. where they list mm -hmm. recordings and things, just a short list. You've got uh, Chris Bodie, Alan Jackson, Vince Gill, George Strait, Rodney Crowell, Martina McBride, Bob Seeger, Loretta Lynn, Joe Cocker, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Brooks and Dunn, Jimmy Buffett, Mark Knopfler, Reba McIntyre, Wyona, Emmy Lou Harris, Leanne Rhines, Elvis Presley. Yeah, well, no, I, would, <laughs> I, I wouldn't put that up there. I mean, it's technically true, but... Uh, it's a duet. It's yeah, a it's one of those things where somebody thought it would be a good idea to... Uh, well, you... To, 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 yeah. To, to, to do, I think they did like a duets album of some contemporary country singers with Elvis. <laughs> Maybe it was a Christmas album. I can't honestly remember what it was. But whatever it was, the idea being they, they had come up with a technology where they could mask, Isolate him. They could mask the instruments on his original tracks. Well, they enough. did a tour like They did a... a yeah, movie. well, yeah. Now, yeah, that's it a whole a great separate tour. thing. I don't know yeah. if you saw it, but it was I'm, fantastic. I'm not, but I'm, yeah, I bet right. it is. Tim McGraw, Marty Stewart, Faith Hill, Jim Lauderdale, Merle Haggard, The Chieftains, Willie Nelson, Richard Marks, Clint Black, Peter Cetera, Dina Carter, Toby Keith, The Mavericks, Keith Urban, Travis Tritt, Pam Tillis, Alabama, Mark Chestnut, Kenny Rogers, Mindy McCready, Lori Morgan, Hank Williams Jr., Jeff Foxworthy, Dusty Springfield, Conway Twitty, Bellamy Brothers, Randy Travis, Susie Bogus, Jerry Douglas, Chet Atkins. I wish I could tell you I remember each and every song. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> well, that's quite a that's quite a repertoire. You ought to be pretty proud. Well, of I'm, I'm very I'm very pleased. You know, I I, uh, I mean it's it's one of those things that my wife and I talk about how lucky we've been because there has definitely been um, you know a decline in the music business. Sure. I mean it's not you know, when we were kids there just weren't that many options. That, you know, the three major networks went off the air at midnight, uh, TV networks, sure, you know. Sure, I'm old and, enough to remember uh, that. So there was sports and, and, and TV and, you know, movies, all that kind of stuff, but obviously no internet, no video games. And then, of course, with the change in technology where people could you know, stream yeah. or download without having to pay, all those things let up, yeah. All those things have combined to, to, to bring about a sharp decline I, yeah, in the music business. You know, yeah, I, I don't know if music is important to kids as important to kids as it as it is for our generation. I don't think it can be because just because there are so many more options available. That's interesting. When we were kids there weren't that many options. So we had you know, to, you we could had, be a we job. had to entertain ourselves. Yeah, yeah, you know, you could be into whatever you were into, but music was one of the few options available back yeah, then. Yeah. But anyway, one of the things I was going to say is that my wife and I talk about it. I was very fortunate that my rise, if you will, through the, the, uh, the, the hired gun session player ranks of Nashville kind of corresponded with the, the boom of right. the CD sales. And so for quite a few years there, there was literally more work than anybody could get to. And they would book you sometimes a year in advance just to be sure that they had a particular rhythm section in place well, I, I mean, for it, that to me record. It reminds me of Motown when Jamerson and, and the Funk Brothers would go out on tour, they closed up shop and yeah. didn't record. Right. And I imagine that's similar to what's going on in Nashville. Well, now, it has been. now it's, but now it's very different because now there's, you know, there's a, a generational change in place. There are a lot of beautiful young players in Nashville, young producers, uh, there will soon be, if there aren't already, some young record execs. You know, it's it's an ongoing thing. Uh, it, it it changes hands. You know, and I don't try to stay as busy as I used to. I was going to gonna ask that. I, I mean, I do, just, you, do you? I'm coming back on uh, November fifteenth. I want to be booked sixteenth. And you know, are, do you mm -hmm. do that now, or do you are kind of more well, selective? Well, because of this this co-production venture I've got with these other two buddies of mine we can steer a, a good percentage of 
how busy we want to be, just in what records we actually take on. Why don't you tell me about this? What, what were you saying? Well, about and first I should tell you, my, my partners are a, a brilliant, absolutely brilliant producer slash publisher, music publisher in Nashville named Frank Liddell. Uh -huh. he's, just a, he's just a genius, and I don't use that word lightly. And my other partner is, is a brilliant engineer named Chuck Ainley, who also has been Mark's co-producer for many years. Okay. And this guy is, there is not a better engineer on the planet. I mean, again, absolute genius. And so anyway, we, we have become very close friends through the years. I had been friends with both Chuck and Frank. They didn't know each other. And I kept saying, you know, I've got to get you guys together. You would like each other. I did that, and they instantly hit it off. And we just finally decided, let's just take on a couple projects ourselves because we, we liked each other personally and we knew we had shared music instincts. So we've done uh, uh, a, a handful of records. We've only been doing this, I guess, about a year and a half now, maybe a little longer. Uh, but we, we've got Miranda Lambert's new record is one that we did. And uh, we did an album on a young man named David Nail, a wonderful singer named David Nail. We've got one finished on Leanne Womack, who in my book is the greatest living country singer. Cool. Period. Now, do you, are in my you, book. Are you playing on all that, or if you're yeah. out of town, mm -hmm. what about if you're if you're out of town? Is that is it probably? Well, if, I'm, if I'm not available, those guys uh, to, to date they've usually waited till I would be back in town if it was something they were going to produce, just the two of them, uh -huh. or or either one of them by themselves. If they can, they'll wait till I get back and be a part of it. Uh, but but we don't have a an ironclad rule that says it. We don't we don't have to work with each other. We just like to you know. Right. But anyway, so that helps me steer a percentage of how busy I am. Obviously, I'm not involved in, in uh, but maybe four or five days worth of tracking on any one of those records. But then all the overdubs and background vocals and all that stuff, of course, takes endless hours. So that uh, occupies a lot of my time. And I still have very strong loyalties to a number of producers and artists in town that have used me for many years. If they ring up, no questions asked, I'm, right. I'm there. The only time I'm not there is if I'm out with Mark. Like I say, now one of the things that's changed now because the record sales, CD sales have dropped. The budgets don't exist like they, like they used to. Um, and back when I was running all the time, thankfully the, the, the town, the business was just awash in money. So the labels were signing anybody they thought they could have a shot with. You know, now they've had to really clamp down the valves, and they and they they, they sign people to kind of more the way it used to be. I suppose we're going back to more like a singles business where they're not going to put the money up necessarily for a full album. They'll, they'll cut a few sides, iTunes it. put them out there, see if they get a reaction. If they don't get a reaction, they unfortunately usually cut, cut them loose and on to the next one. My friends in Nashville, my session pals, if you will, that, that stay busy nowadays, stay busy by doing anything and everything they can get. Demos, anything. Demos, tons of yep. demos and low, what they call low budget records where they're just, you know, it, it, they just don't have the money so they just say we can, we can pay you this, it's scale, that's all it is. And, uh, you know, there's still a fair amount of that work. But again, I, I've, not to sound like an old lion wandering off back into the woods, but <laughs> I've, I've, I've done so much of that, I'm grateful for it. But one of the things that I want to do with what's left of my so-called career is I just want to play the best music I can get in on. Mark fits the bill. Mark is, is chief among that. And, and I can't imagine anything coming about that would change that. You know. I have uh, all right, just two more questions, then we'll be done. Uh, can you tell me, uh, of all time, who are your favorite bass players? And then I'm going to ask you of people that are still alive. So let's go okay. to all time. And they can still be alive. Okay. Well, uh, uh, of, of, of all time, my first big influence, and I didn't really even know who he was when I first began to become aware of him, was Willie Dixon. And to this day, 
stuff he came up with and just as a, as a songwriter and a bass player on that. Yeah, I, I should know more about it. Well, all, all those great Muddy Waters Is records. Is he on the Chuck Berry stuff? No. Uh, he would have been on some of Chuck's stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, upright bass. Upright bass, but just... Blues. Oh, man, and what a player. And just, a, just you know... The right he, note. Always the right note. He, he just had it. And, of course, everybody's favorite, favorite uh, Jamerson just killed. Uh -huh. Joe Osborne, one of my favorites. Uh, Paul McCartney, obviously. Um, Jocko, you know, all, all the usual suspects. Sure. I mean, but, but there are other guys that I really loved, too. Um, there was a, 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 a guy I actually became friends with years later. His name was Lance Hoppen, and he played in that band called Orleans back in the days, and they had several hits. He was another one of those guys. I bought their records, and I fell in love with his bass playing because he was one of those guys that could hear the alternate note, not just play you the obvious yeah, note. He came up with great lines. Is he still alive? He's still alive. Good. I hope he's still playing. I haven't talked to him in years, but I hope and trust he is. Beautiful player, great player, very soulful, great sound, great. everything. I always loved Emery Gordy. He was one of those guys that uh, had such great imagination. Burning love? Yeah, yeah. yeah you I know. Mean, I can't deny that. And, and Jerry Sheff, obviously. Um, you know, it just goes on and on. There are so many great bass players. I love David Hood from Muscle Shoals oh to this God. day. Oh, my God. Well, my favorite. Just um, astonishing. The nicest player. guy you'd ever met. Absolutely. Too. Complete sweetheart. Complete sweetheart. I'm going to get him up here. Oh, yeah. you should. You'd love him. And yeah, he would love you. I was you. able to, he's using one of our, the Lakeland basses. Yeah. When he records now. Oh, great. great. You listen to what he played on and just, I mean, it's the best. It yeah. doesn't get any yeah. better. Well, and you know, I have to I have to mention two other names too. Um, in Nashville, my my friend Michael Rhodes, I, I, I just so adore his playing. But and I will apologize to you, Michael, as I say this, because it's what I've always said though. The King Kong Daddy in my book in Nashville is is David Hungate. Okay. I mean, I always have I've said it many times. I was able to work a little bit with Dave. Well. Yeah. David is one of those guys, he's such a consummate musician, and he was one of those guys that always, I so loved how he would play such beautiful, fundamental Perfect. bass, and then he would find one little spot and Toto just give you, would yeah, be David what, yeah, four, yeah. he just, he just give you one little spot where you go, oh my God, that, that is <laughs> a master. I got work. a chance to hang out and watch Dave Hungate and Joe Osborne trade stories, that would be something oh, we should well, do. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, I mean, it was just so cool yeah. to hear these guys yeah. talk. Yeah. These are, you know, two Well, I've always kings. told all my bass player pals back in Nashville and anybody else, you know, that in my mind, David Hungate could gather all of us bass players up in Nashville, tie us up in a little sack, <laughs> drop us in the Chicago River like a bunch of unwanted kittens. He's, he's the guy. And I have to say one other thing, too because he doesn't get mentioned much anymore, but he certainly should. Uh, uh, the, the great Nashville bassist, Bob Moore, to okay. this day. Uh, I mean, just for being a swinging, just playing the up, right upright? note and driving up. He played electric as well, but but he was always he's known for the, his upright playing. Give us some, what are the track? Big oh, he, he he's played on, on uh, I mean, he played on, there's a, He's, he's probably one of the most recorded bassists of all, all the time, but he did a, a ton of, uh, uh, you know, he, he was the Nashville mainstay. He, he and se several guys that preceded him. And, Johnny Cash and, stuff? Or? I don't know that he did any Johnny Cash. He probably did at some point, but he yeah. played with Jerry Lee Lewis on a lot of those records. He played on, uh, uh, you know, Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn, Dolly Parton, on and on and on. One of the things he's probably most known for was the, his work with Roger Miller. That's him on King of the Road. Oh, okay. That's Bob. I don't, you yeah. And he had that great Very background. Good. He, he, he I don't know him personally, and I don't know is he his still people alive? back. He's still alive, still playing great from what, I, from what I've been he, told. Do you know where he lives? He lives somewhere in Nashville, but I don't know where. You know? You've never met him? I have met him a couple times, okay. yeah. Um, but, uh, again, he's just was and I'm sure he is just an astonishing musician and he was they, they all said you know they called him king back in the day because he was the guy that was, drove yeah, those yeah. bands I mean he made he he made them how about contemporary say LA or New York you got anybody who well tips your 
Uh, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be up on, on probably the new hot guns, if you will. Well, I'm thinking the 70s. But uh, certain, well, certainly in L.A., certainly Bob Glob, I adore his plan, and, and of course, Will Lee. Uh, Bob Babbitt was a friend of mine, and, I, and I, I, know. I, I know he was a obviously one of the mainstays in Detroit. I somehow or another always saw him as a New York player because when he moved to Nashville, he had come from New York, and and, uh -huh. and uh, I got a chance to meet him. Oh, he was a, he was a he was a beauty, and he was something else. Yeah, right. but uh, again, and, and obviously, uh, you know, Pino is off the scale. He's doing pretty ridiculous. well now. I think. Oh man, and, and the way he reinvented so. himself. Well, just... I was going to say, he was one of those guys. He, you know, obviously, he he broke open his own territory with that brilliant fretless work that he did. Right, with Paul but, Young, and then but, he but, got to a point where he didn't want to do it anymore. Well, and he was very wise. I don't know what his, you know, what led him to it, I would be guessing, and, and I don't want to do that, but however he arrived at, he was able to show the world, there's more to me than that. Exactly. How about a load of this, and he can back it have up. You, have you heard the D'Angelo record that he's on? Uh, yeah, a little of it. I don't own it, but I, what I heard of it was fantastic. Yeah, he's not on the whole record, but... Yeah, I know bass players that listen to that and they say, you know, it's got to be all overdubs and cut togethers because it's just not humanly possible. But Pino yeah. says it's straight ahead. Yeah, it's recording. I, I, I think so. I mean, that's a man at the top of his game. And, and, and again, his, I've not met him, but I, my my guess is is that he, you know, he's got the kind of confidence that he he'll wade in there and go for it and probably land it. You know, his confidence is his, is his bass playing. He's the nicest guy in the world. You never know. That this guy's, you know, the who first call. Yeah. He, yeah. Hopefully, we're going to get him right here in about three weeks. He's Great. going through town. Great. Uh, playing with the who. And, yeah. Um, asked me about a mute system on a bass, so hopefully we'll have that. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah. Turn you on in that one too. Well, cool. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Oh, my, my pleasure. Let's Absolutely. go look at some cool vintage basses and cool. go from there. Great. <laughs> Show us just a couple, well, finger techniques. Well, how okay. Going? Well, I don't, you know, as I, as I mentioned to you before, uh, I've had it happen more than once where some kid would wander in while I was trying to bass out in the music store and say, I could hear him say to his mate, hey, we're going to miss Glenn Moore. Check it out, check it out. And within 30 seconds, they'd be so bored, they'd turn around <laughs> and <laughs> leave. Because you weren't playing the. Uh, yeah, because I'm not sure. I, 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 I mean, the first one to tell you, I mean, uh, I, I'm. I'm not a chops merchant um, by any sense of that. Um, everything I do, I always say I'm, I'm totally and utterly dependent upon my collaborators. And, I, and the music I aspire to, have always aspired to, is songwriter driven music, if you will. That said, when I hear a song for the first time, hopefully I've heard it without it being a full-blown demo, I like to hear it where it's just absolutely... Your mind has to fill, yeah, it, fill just it up. Exactly. That's my favorite way of hearing it. So, that said, if I'm lucky enough to get that, if a, if a singer-songwriter, say, uh, or, or the artist, whoever brings the song, presents it, if we can get them to play it to us live or hear a recording of it where it's just piano and vocal or guitar vocal or whatever, as stripped down as possible, that's my favorite way to hear a song. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment that I feel like I actually begin to go to work because often is not. Those first few things you hear will become sort of the, the motif of what you come up with. And for me, it's not a, so much a chops thing. As I mentioned earlier, it, 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 it's, it is a sonic thing. So that said, uh, one of the things that I kind of pride myself on being able to do is hopefully approach things with an open mind. And for that, uh, through the years, I've just have kind of not, not come up with anything necessarily revolutionary new, but 
just trying to get the right sound behind whoever I'm about to record with or, or play live with. So, for instance, again, this is not ground-breaking territory, but, but I will often, you know. Are you muting? I'm muting. Okay. I mean, I, I just love the old Motown stuff. I love the sound as much as the playing itself. And, you know, uh, so I will often mute. It, it almost phone. looks like you're playing with a pick, but you're not. No, uh, okay. I'm not. So, uh, you know, for certain things I'll play that way. Um, uh, obviously, just, just the usual finger style. Now, you both fingers? I, I generally do sometimes. Uh, I used to, it's funny, years ago when I was a kid, I, I alternated between my ring finger and first finger. I don't know why the, the huh. middle finger just was kind of out, out, tucked out in space, but, uh, but I, when I went back in earnest in, in studying string bass, uh, Shifted back to the first two things, okay, and primarily because of with that. your left hand, you do the upright one, two, four, or do you uh, use the third finger? Yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I grew up. I, I didn't grow up playing upright, but the little bit of study I did early on, I was taught the Samandel method. So I still use one, two, that four. fingering, although I have shifted. Uh, I've been taking some lessons from a brilliant symphonic musician named Joel Reist, R E I. Uh, R E I S T. Uh, he's the principal bassist with the Nashville Symphony. Okay. And Joel is a student of the Francois Raboth method, which is a very different fingering, where basically, uh, and this is actually kind of spilled into my electric playing as well. Uh, the Raboth method basically, instead of having half positions and intermediate positions the way the, the, the Samandel method taught, uh, his ideology is more where you, you basically you anchor your thumb on the back of the neck in several different places huh. and then you pivot your hand but you use that thumb as your reference Were point. you using that technique on stage the other night? I, I, did definitely, that use, I definitely use that, yeah, I definitely use that for my upright work. The, Again, I mean it's a blend because I, I, I do have a certainly a holdover from the Samandel day so that third finger doesn't get as much. Well, use in the lower the positions, yeah, the lower positions One, two, just. And again, I, I play. It's a it's a big seven eighths bass. You got to have a. You got to have some strength to get those strings down on the neck and hold them there. And and in the lower positions, on string bass, the uh, some guys did it, but most guys relied on having both those fingers. Right, right. To hold it down. Note. Yeah, which so I still in the lower positions I still do that. I have. Uh, kind of unconsciously, I think, adapted to some of, uh, some of that Raboth technique where, again, instead of just shifting constantly with the left hand, sometimes I'll try to keep things in a general region and just shift, again, I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. instead of shifting the whole hand, if I'm just going up for a note, you know, oh, I don't necessarily uh, move the thumb. I'm not doing that to be Clever. It just is that harder to intonate on the upright bass that method, or is it just? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, the theory uh, that Francois Raboff came with, uh, he was totally self-taught, completely self-taught, and he had nobody to draw from. He didn't. When did he live? Uh, he's still alive. Oh, okay. um, he's. Uh, I don't think he might be 80 years old or something like that. Now he may be. Uh, I hope I'm not insulting him, but yeah. he's a phenomenal player. Uh, where is he? Where is he, he out I think he lives in France, but I honestly okay. don't. I don't know where, and I've never met the man. I'd love to. Okay. Uh, but, but his theory was that, it, it, particularly because of the lifelong struggle for playing string bass, as well as a, a, a fretless bass, electric bass, is intonation. That's your, that's your opponent, if you will. Absolutely. And his theory was if I really teach my left hand, if I teach my thumb, probably paraphrasing, he might not appreciate some of the, my own theory of what he's got going. But anyway, I think he feels like if I, if I teach my left hand where these anchor points are, then I can just adjust accordingly, just swing the fingers right. a little before, a little in front of the, the thumb or, or you know, further south, if you will. But if that thumb stays there, and I know where that thumb is supposed to be, it increases 
the odds of landing the note in tune. Uh -huh. As opposed to Samantha where you had to memorize all the half positions, all the intermediate positions. Now, there's an argument for that too. Right. But and and the world is full of so your, your players that do that. Your approach is the both combination. I've of just both. kind of become into my own, be, have been becoming into my own uh, uh, hybrid of it. If you and again, it's not like a real conscious thing, but so much of uh, uh, you know playing the upright, I it, it can't help but bleed back into my electric playing. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I used to play steel guitar for many years, and one of the holdovers of that, there's a couple of holdovers, I don't have any example worked up, but, but I will, will uh, you know, sometimes get a little rhythm thing going, uh, basically where I'm pulling down with the thumb, and then using these two fingers. Yeah. Let's see what that sounds like. something I consciously set out to do. I just, a couple times on record dates, I would hear something in my head and, and, uh, uh, and realize I was kind of using that leftover steel guitar uh, technique. There's one thing that I can show you that I came up with years ago. Uh, on a, on a Knopfler track that we did called uh, uh, Hill Farmer blues and there's only a kind of a taste of it on the record because it has a short fade but but we messed with that I just couldn't seem to find anything that was particularly cool on the bass but finally I, I dropped my D string the songs based in E minor and uh, and I uh, eventually I kind of came up with this little part that became the, the you know the main structure of the bass line where I'm playing again out of E minor, but I started doing this hammer-on thing using the, the open D and then hammer -on. And then blending that with this technique, this goofy technique I'm talking about, I came up with a little part that goes. Jocko, I'm not a, uh, I'm not, I'm not a Pino as much as I love those guys. Uh, I, 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 You're I don't, I don't, yeah, I am myself. Like I say, I don't have tons of facility, tons of chops. I've got a good theoretical background. I, I think a halfway decent ear for harmony and for the chops can other. be a double edged, right? I mean, people, I just too don't. much is. Yeah, and and again, you know, I, I'll tell you this. There was a guy that I, I was, I followed two other bass players into this guy's band, both of whom just could completely kick my ass any day. Chop they, could, they could kick my ass when they were asleep. You know, they were, they were just such extraordinary players. And I got the gig after the second one of these guys departed. And I and, and did a gig one night and, and it was early days with that band and, and I finally went to the singer whose band it was, and I said, why am I here? I said, you know as well as I do, these guys are much better players, more advanced and better gear and all, everything. You know? And the guy just without missing a beat, he said, you're here because you make me sound good. Those guys were here to make themselves so? sound good. And a little light went off at that point. Because again, uh, I, I, I make no bones about it. I'm a collaborator. Uh, I don't I haven't made a solo record, so my pals ask me when I will, I don't know that it would ever happen. And if it did, it would probably be more of a, from a songwriter's point of view than a bass player. Content point. with the bass's, you know, function I just, in music and yeah, you're happy. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 
every every artist that I work with, I, I as I said earlier, I, I try to get into character and play for them, play that you know, try to make their songs come to life. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, it's, so that is sort of my philosophy. It's again more about sounds. I will use a pick uh, if I think that's right. I mean, I love nothing more than just to, you know, just just a bass with fresh round rounds on it running through an amp and just beating the billy hell right. out of it with a pick is, you know, it's, it's my only chance to be 17 again. But I, I'm, to me, it's all valid. And, and, Whatever uh, the song calls for. Yeah, and again, I think, I, you know, after having had a career of accompanying other people, I think I have arrived at certain stylistic things. I certainly have my own set of sensibilities, but again, my heroes back in the day, uh, most of those guys were so great, and they were visionaries. I mean, you know, so I just borrowed from everybody, as we do, and uh, maybe there's little bits and pieces of all those guys in me, and hopefully there are a few subtle things here and there I can add to it going forward. You know. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.